We're at 6.01. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so buckle up. Um, looking forward to share, sharing a lot of what we have been working on and will continue to work on. Uh, so thank you so much for attending. All right, welcome to the first quarterly town hall of 2021. Alderman Andre Vasquez hosting. All right, so here is a breakdown of the agenda we'll be going over today. Um, we'll be covering first get to get to meet the team. We've got some new members on the team share our ward vision. Um, we at the beginning of the year kind of planned uh, our vision. So we want to share that with you. Then we have constituent services, uh, development updates, uh, my legislative efforts, uh, a section we're terming open government, uh, showing you how we are accessible as our government, uh, which will deal with some of our community zoning process and the people's budget. Uh, then we'll talk community engagement through our neighbor network and then have an open forum for questions. All right. Bam. So here are these beautiful headshots of our team. Uh, happy to introduce you all. Some of you obviously already know. We've got uh, Jessica Peters, our chief of staff. Uh, yep, there's a wave. Uh, Jeffrey Kubich, our director of policy and development. Uh, Pooja Ravindran, uh, Director of Constituent Services. We've got Lindsay Tillman, our Manager of Communications and Volunteers, um, as well as Community Outreach, and Alan Snyder, our Community Engagement Manager. So at the beginning of the year, we all wanted to, you know, after having about a year and a half in office and our legs somewhat underneath us, to have a conversation about what our vision would be uh, going forward. And uh, we have a uh, we could do a whole meeting on what that vision was, but we boiled it down to some very important pillars uh, as, in, as far as what we see our office doing. So um, our, our core competencies, if you will, would be optimizing constituent services, right? Being able to deliver those public services to our neighbors as best as possible uh, to foster economic development uh, through whatever means we can to help bolster our business districts, to reimagine public safety, um, and finding different ways. And that's a variety of lenses where, whether it's uh, uh, criminal activity to COVID is public safety and everything under that umbrella. Uh, also uh, my commitment to having open and accessible government. So the kind of government that where you understand how it works, you're able to use it as a vehicle to find solutions. That's something that's always been central to, to what I do. Uh, and five uh, termed it as progressive values. And that's showing those values through legislation, advocacy, and policy. Um, so yep, that's a, kind of in a nutshell where we start from. So we'll go into constituent services. Uh, we've got some of our team on the picture here. All right, so this will give a breakdown of what we've been seeing in our office since uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, so if you look at the constituent request, uh, first, we'll go to the top six requests just to give you an idea of what we've been hearing out of our office. So the number one reason people call is policy, right? Something is either looking to be passed in city council or might be introduced or there might be concerns about something. We get tend to get a lot of those calls. Um, COVID vaccination really took up a large share at 12%. Um, I mean, that's no surprise there. Snow, we had about 10% since the beginning of the year. Uh, the calls were about snow, clearly with the snowstorm we went through, a lot of the shoveling uh, efforts that we uh, kind of endeavored in, we got a lot of calls about that. Next up are parking, trash and recycling, and mail. Um, obviously, there was a lot of stalled mail at the USPS uh, office uh, in the 60660 zip code as well as uh, by Lawrence uh, Rockwell area. So a uh, quick tidbit, in February, we received 240 snow related requests out of a total of 1,003 um, that were related to kind of the snow related requests. So out of our total um, calls that we were getting in, as well as 311, we received 6,773 constituent service requests. And we resolved out of that 6,682 putting us at a 98.6 clearance rate, uh, which is an improvement from quarters past. Um, but I will also note 
it is uh, the beginning of the year, so that the sample sizes are smaller. As we continue moving, we'll see how we've been faring. Uh, also, let me take a quick, quick little break while we do this. So if you have questions about anything that's being presented, please feel free to put those in the chat. We will go back to the chat at the end of the presentation um, so that we can answer those questions as well. So next we've got our development update. All righty. So this is kind of the big announcement that we wanted to get out there and we figured we might as well start and letting you all know. So um, a lot of what our office has been focused on now that we kind of got a handle on some of the services as well as some of the legislative work that we've been doing and even the community engagement was really focused also on economic development in the ward. And I am very proud to let you all know that as of now, uh, currently we have $30 million worth of public investment going on in the 40th ward. Uh, some of which existed prior to uh, my taking office, much of it uh, coming from work that we did since I've taken office. And so we want to share a little bit of that. So here is a quick overview of some of those uh, developments, but I will go into more detail as I go forward along. But I wanted to definitely get that out there and let folks know that we have been working really hard to make sure that we're using public dollars for public investment here in the 40th Ward to help improve where improvement is needed. Um, and to provide different opportunities, which we'll show shortly. All right, so the big one that kind of a lot of folks have heard me talk about since before taking office uh, was really the stretch of Lincoln that cuts through the 40th Ward. So uh, part of that $30 million, uh, $30 million announcement as far as public investments, 15 million of that um, is something that I secured through our office. We've got a TIF investment that will cover Lincoln Avenue from Lawrence, the Western, all the way to Catalpa. So that is the Ainsley Arch Plaza, which um, what you all have seen, and you know, this is a, a mock-up of what it's going, to, uh, what it's been looking like, is the temporary version of the Ainsley Arch Plaza. We actually have $2.4 million that are appropriated in order to create a permanent Ainsley Arch Plaza, which would be more activated as a space, maybe have a stage area and other things. That will be a community process uh, as we move forward on a more permanent Ainsley Arch Plaza, but it also uh, mostly includes a full streetscape from Western all the way to Catalpa on Lawrence. So that is pedestrianization efforts, meaning a widening of the streets where possible, uh, creating more public gathering spaces. So the same way the Ainsley Arch Plaza is kind of a place where people can gather. We wanna have more of those junction points along Lincoln so that as uh, neighbors coming from Lincoln Square across Lawrence, they're able to see how much more we can offer here, check out different places to stop by, help support some of the local businesses, fill some of the empty storefronts. Um, so that is a large part of what the funding will be, a full on streetscape that'll be happening. Um, we're also looking to make it more bike friendly um, because of the narrow nature of Lincoln. Uh, you know, there is a conversation of whether you widen the streets or create a bike lane or use sharrows um, arrows to kind of delineate when uh, bikes and vehicles are on the road. Um, as we get more and that gets developed, just like everything else we've done, it's all community process and making sure that we get the input from neighbors before we take steps forward. Um, another part of this component uh, that we've been looking at is something we call Catalpa West. Uh, we'll get to Catalpa East later, but Catalpa West is Catalpa between Western and Lincoln. Um, one of, if not the widest road in the city. So that was uh, prior uh, in decades past, used as a place where trolleys would go and, and make their turn. So there's a lot of space there, but that needs to be more pedestrianized with some islands, potentially diagonal parking, and also creating a public space there as well. Um, part of Lincoln Avenue North, which is what we're calling the area from really Western all the way to Catalpa, will be the Lana District or the Lincoln Avenue North Arts District. So that is uh, something that I was very passionate about and wanted to make sure we worked through this vision to really bring an arts district to the 40th Ward. Uh, now that means some of the performance space creation, uh, integration of more street art, uh, you know, so obviously some of what we've seen 
at the Ains Arts Plaza showcases that, but also in other places along the area. We've also uh, successfully, through some conversations, um, been able to get live work spaces created on the retail um, floor. So live work spaces are basically kind of what they sound like. It's a place where someone can live, but they also have a storefront. So if you're an artist, you're a photographer, you want to get your own studio, rather than paying two separate rental uh, you know, fees for spaces, you can combine it into one space, which makes it a lot more manageable and affordable. Uh, we also want to have affordable housing and affordable retail as part of this arts district. Um, you know, me being someone who grew up in Wicker Park before it got gentrified and, and, and you know, nicer, for lack of a better term, um, I was priced out through that. So I know that when we're working on developing an area, a big concern of mine is the displacement that occurs sometimes when properties values rise and things get more gentrified. So we want to make sure that there is an intentional uh, focus on having affordable housing in the area. So as to make sure that the people that live here stay here and the artists that help create this incubator are able to live here as well. Uh, we are also reaching out to uh, try to get SPIF, so it's uh, small business increment fund specialization to support some of the hotel motels in the area. So when we first took office, um, I started reaching out and starting to have conversations with some of the motels out of concern of what had happened in decades past. And some of those conversations led to some real epiphanies that some of the owners of the hotel motel felt like they had never been reached out to as a community partner. And what I wanted to make the case to them was, you know, if you add some fresh paint, you change the way you present your business, you can have a different level of clientele. Uh, so it doesn't have the connotation people place on some of those uh, establishments. And therefore, they're able to benefit more. It helps really frame some of the area. Uh, and it ends up being a more cost effective solution than trying to acquire the land through eminent domain as had been happening uh, prior. So we wanna make an honest attempt at trying to get uh, these owners to be partners. And also we have had conversations with Commissioner Cox of uh, planning and development for the city to establish a mural fest in 2022 along Lincoln. So being able to really showcase a lot of that street art and celebrate and bring more attention therefore bringing more uh, really people who can patronize the area. So that is Lincoln Avenue North and the Lana District. There is also uh, already had been the Lawrence Streetscape, which was a $10 million TIF investment. Uh, and that's a streetscape from Lawrence, uh, on Lawrence from Western to the river. Also seeking pedestrianization, creating safer walkability. If you look at the um, rendering in the picture here, uh, that is one of the spaces that we had been uh, kind of looking at. So if you look, there's a lot more space to sit down. There's pavers, there's more green space, there's new signage that will be coming up. Also talked about pedestrian islands, there will be a bike lane integration, um, but really just maximizing the space and bringing it into 2021 uh, and beyond. Uh, also kind of adjacent to, to those developments, we have the Western Avenue Corridor Study so that isn't a development, but it is a um, process and study through which the city will look at uh, the western stretch from Howard all the way to Addison or Addison to Howard if you're going north. Um, so it crosses over the 47th, 40th, uh, part of the 49th and 50th wards. Uh, through this process, which will be a community process, we'll identify how best to maximize that space when it comes to pedestrianizing some of the area what the business districts will look like along Western in the next 20, 30 to 50 years, uh, knowing that the way we use vehicles uh, is diff will be different uh, when you think about all the different auto shops and, and, and you know, car sales places. Um, really figuring out through zoning what we want the future to look like. All right. Um, and since we're all in the area, there's the Lawrence and Western, which is the fifth third bank site. Uh, shown on the picture here. Um, so currently there, we had gotten word that Hubbard Street was interested in the space with an unnamed grocer tenant. Uh, once we got word of that, we sent out a public notice to let neighbors know what we had found out and really try to make the case that what we needed to do going forward, if there was a way to go forward, is to have a planned development. Now, just to kind of level set, looking at that lot, um, 
what Hubbard Street's idea was didn't need any zoning approval. They were looking at how to move forward without having any, <clears throat> having to need us weigh in on any of it, um, which is why we got the word out, put out public notice that we wanted to see a plan development there to at least find some way to move forward with the community. Um, so that led to a community visioning meeting and survey. We got 1,200 neighbors responding, which is the most we've gotten in an event in a really short amount of time. Uh, what we heard from that survey was there was a concern about the local small businesses and the impact of this unnamed grocer. Um, also, what was a um, surprise and, and really uh, thankful to hear is it supports a lot of what we've been working on is that neighbors in the area supported density of up to six floors if there was an affordability component. So it was good to get that information uh, proactively so that whatever conversations occur, we know what the community wanted and can try to figure out if there is a solution there. Now, because we wanted that grocer to be named and they still have not uh, and didn't in that time name who they were, um, that's something we're gonna continue to push on. And I think it really affects the conversations we're having. Um, we did hear from Hubbard Street um, after the public notice, we got a sense of what they wanted to try to do to perhaps meet us somewhere. Um, they did say they expressed an interest in electing to be in a plan development. So that is when a private developer uh, agrees to a plan development rather than being forced into one. Uh, and, and honestly, because there's no zoning change, that would be a hard thing to accomplish. So that was a good sign. Uh, there also was a conversation about using the lot on Gunnison by Western. Uh, so Gunnison, Western Lincoln, kind of where they cross, uh, using that lot for affordable housing. Uh, so a residential property there. Um, we did not get any answer from them in regard to the small business concern, which is the first concern we were hearing about. Um, there has been no formal proposal, but this is just what the conversations have been. Um, and due to all of this, and prior to some of the information we were getting, I submitted a down zoning ordinance into city council. Now, typically I would not take a step like that. I think there's concerns about other people using down zoning ordinances to keep out affordable housing. And so I do have my concerns when we submitted it. However, what I wanted to make sure was the case is that as conversations move forward with Hubber Street or anyone, uh, that people understood that every option is on the table. And so I wanted to make sure that that was clear to the neighbors and I could provide as much understanding as possible as conversations continue and we'll continue to update folks as uh, more becomes available. Uh, other developments, I know there's a lot. Um, the Peterson Ridge Metro Station, after 10, 10 plus years of wanting to see some movement here, the work has finally begun. So about a week and a half, well, we had known it was coming, but about a week and a half ago, we started seeing the clearing of the staging area. Um, so it is moving. It's currently uh, going through the permitting process with an expected time of completion. They gave us 12 months, I'm gonna say 18, because you never know how weather impacts things. You never know what you don't know. So I'd like to give a little buffer there, but we're making sure we're in communications with Metra and Union Pacific so that any updates that we get, we're providing to uh, the neighbors. So parking is provided. I believe it's somewhere between 30 and 40 spaces um, for the vehicles, although it's, um, it's got a little bit of a cul-de-sac or pull-up area, but we do have some parking spaces there. But I do think it's gonna open up a conversation about permit parking potentially in the area. So as the local block clubs or any neighbors have any concerns about that, please reach out to our office uh, so we can walk you through what that permit parking process looks like because it entails petitioning, it entails getting over 65% of support of an area that folks wish to get permitted. And that takes a lot of effort, but we wanna make sure we're clear at the outset with any neighbors that contact us about it. Uh, so I mentioned Catalpa West a couple slides ago. This uh, I'll now mention is Catalpa East. So that is Catalpa between Clark and Ashland. It's where the Black Trans Lives Matter mural uh, is and where we had farmer's markets this past uh, summer. So we're looking at that being a permanent public space that would kind of bridge together some of Andersonville, 
um, with some of the parts that don't have as much support and kind of lead in Edgewater. Uh, it also would be a place to do programming, to do events, to do a little market and help support the local businesses. So we found out um, actually this week that there are about $2 million appropriated through the city capital plan for potential work there at Catalpa East. Uh, as with all things, once we get more information, we'll have the community design and planning process uh, so that we are able to reflect the in input from all the neighbors in the area. Uh, and then finally, we've got Vision Clark. So that's the Clark Devon area. There's a $3.8 million appropriated there for streetscaping as well. Uh, and once again, a community process. And we're also looking at reimagining the public space that's located in front of the 24th District uh, Police Station, as that is public property. Um, so as we get more on that, we will let you know. All right. And now we got to go to the parks. So we've got a lot of the street and infrastructure we were talking through. There's also um, through the parks district, they had actually gone and, and put in um, requests for TIF in order to improve some of the local park and river area. So uh, some of it is in the next couple slides. This right here is the Northside College Prep restoration and river access. So that's behind Northside College Prep, whereas uh, part of it really feels like a prairie. There doesn't seem to be a real separation between the park and the river. Um, there are a lot of areas that are not, uh, they don't have clear line of sight. And there's just a lot of potential for students to actually work and learn from the river. So uh, through this uh, project, there are $2 million that uh, include the cost of design and construction uh, for the area that is uh, River Park right behind Northside College Prep. Also in the area in River Park, there's a paddling and adaptive paddling program infrastructure. So there's a $750,000 appropriated for design and construction. What this will do is it'll support the first adaptive paddling program on the Chicago River, which would allow folks with uh, disabilities access to new outdoor recreation opportunities and expands on the work that had already been uh, done there. So that's something to really be proud of that we're going to see you know, first in the city here in the 40th. Also, there's been, there have been funds appropriated to improve the playground and turf area at Winnemac Park, uh, $200,000 appropriated for Winnemac Park, as well as for Gross Park, uh, which has $175,000 appropriated through Parks District. So those will see improvements coming up as well. So definitely a lot of development. I wanted to make sure that neighbors knew um, a lot of stuff that we're, we're doing out of this office and in partnership with other groups and glad to be doing it. So now we'll go into our legislative efforts. Uh, this is not a recent city council picture as COVID. So let's throw that out there. I'm sure you guys knew that. Um, so here are some of the resolutions that uh, I either introduced or co-sponsored. Uh, so calling for the establishment of an elected uh, Chicago school board. Uh, this is something that for over a decade, people have been fighting for, and um, you know, Mayor Lightfoot, um, in coming into office, was supportive and elected school board. I think we've heard a little bit of pushback more recently, so we wanted to reiterate our support and fight for that. Um, also, I introduced uh, a resolution calling on uh, Springfield to change the term alderman to alder, so as to make it gender neutral and give people the ability to define how they want to be titled. I also submitted a resignation, uh, a resolution calling for the resignation of FOP President John Catanzara amidst uh, support of the domestic terrorist attack on January 6th of our capital and kind of minimizing the kind of criminal activity that was going on there when we know that even officers were murdered or killed there. Um, so we called that out also called for the resignation of the Chicago Postmaster Wanda Pratter, as we had been working to try to improve the postal office and really reaching out with the demands we we're hearing from our neighbors. And the Chicago Postmaster would not even meet with elected officials. Um, also called for a hearing on reforms for a transparent, equitable remap redistricting process. So as we're looking at how Chicago has typically looked at remapping, there's always been concerns about transparency and accountability. 
but also recognizing that whatever moves forward has to account for equity and representation for populations that have not had it. So this isn't just um, Black and Latinx folk, it's also Asian folks. It's also like, how do we count LGBTQ as far as representation? All those things need to be discussed and a hearing, so we called for that. And the good news is in talking to uh, the lead sponsor who I sponsored it with, uh, Alderman Brian Hopkins, I got word that that hearing should be happening in April. That's what we've been hearing. Um, we also called for a hearing on the state of social services and programs to address the violence increase that was going on. Um, this was in response to where we've seen a lot of the funding go, which has been the Chicago Police Department, which already had what I believe to be a, a bloated and large budget of 1.7 billion. And every time we talk about addressing violence or ac criminal activity, all we hear is putting more money in that department as opposed to identifying what other methods are helpful when we're talking about mental health services, social work, uh, street outreach, and other things that uh, deserve funding uh, because they are proactive measures and they, uh, in a lot of instances, provide better results. We want to call for a hearing uh, for that. All right, and then these are ordinances and orders that I either uh, introduced or signed on to. So this one is one that we identified almost immediately upon taking office and even before. So I assume those of you who have used the 311 app or filed a request online, you submit your 311 request for, I'll give an example I got, removing a tree stump. So what you typically get back when you submit your request is your average time of completion for a tree stump apparently is 14 days. Now, I submitted a tree stump request upon taking office and got an email last week that said it would be 14 days from 2019 to get it completed. And that's just unacceptable. Um, we know that a lot of the departments are under-resourced and they need funding, but we also have to make sure that we communicate effectively with neighbors what realistic expectation times are. Uh, the way the city currently works, uh, they rely on the departments to do kind of their math and let them know what an estimated time uh, would look like. I have a bit of an issue with that. I think if you ask a department what they expect, they're going to tell you the best case scenario. Now, if you looked at software data and Salesforce is the software that runs 311, you could just track how long something goes from opening a ticket to completing a ticket in a system, get an average number of how long that takes, and give folks a more realistic response. And we wanna do that because we want neighbors to know, hey, if this thing says you're gonna get a trash can in two days and it takes maybe two months, depending on resource, let's at least be real and level set with folks. So that's something that uh, I'm pretty adamant about pushing. Uh, as we get more on that, we'll let you know. Also signed on to the Anjanette Young Ordinance, which would provide uh, more warrant uh, execution restrictions so part of it, uh, for example, the Anjanette Young Ordinance proposes that officers when conducting a raid should not point guns at children. Uh, that has to be explicitly written in law. And that is part of what uh, this ordinance provides along with other things. And that was introduced by Maria Haddon and a number of others. Um, we also went for an establishment and maintenance of managed native garden registry. So it's giving people more freedom uh, with their front gardens as well as the Chicago Inclusive Housing Ordinance, which is a change to the Affordable Requirements Ordinance. So currently, if somebody was developing something new that was 10 units or more as far as housing, uh, the city requires them to have one unit or 10% of that development. Uh, we're looking to move that to 20% along with other uh, changes we wanna make as far as what affordability looks like, making sure that we are able to provide housing um, in recognition that housing is a human right. Uh, and then to be introduced, and this is something as far as uh, that's part of like the reimagine safety, part of something that I was passionate before taking office and was actively working on almost since we took office, uh, is the CPAC GAPA hybrid police accountability legislation. So there were two ordinances, CPAC, the Civilian Police Accountability Council, and an ordinance put together by GAPA, the Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability. Uh, people were really on one side or the other. And what I recognized, and this was six to seven months ago, along with a couple other city council members, was that both of the groups needed to resolve their differences in order to create a joint piece of legislation that the city could get behind. Because if we didn't do that, 
then if the administration, the executive branch presented another piece of legislation, you would have three of them dividing up and none would get a majority. So tactically it made sense to get uh, folks in a virtual room together at the table to resolve differences, put together a joint statement and really figure out what this piece of legislation could look like. So um, it was not met with the most um, positive responses because they, these two groups were not, you know, they were at odds at, at different points. But we knew that it was important even when others thought we were trying to water down or do whatever to the legislation. And then finally, six, seven months in with the help of really both of the groups taking leadership um, and understanding what moment we found ourselves in um, after the civil unrest that we all went through in this past year, um, after the need for police accountability, uh, they came together, put out a statement, and now there is a hybrid ordinance that is moving forward and uh, will be introduced. Um, what we did find out in trying to move legislation forward is that the mayor is also presenting a police accountability legislation, said she was going to do it, but it's been a month and she has not introduced anything yet. So what we basically position to neighbors across the city is that as this moves forward, you're going to have two choices. You're going to have the police accountability legislation, that grassroots movement that people have worked for years to try to craft and now have a consensus ordinance. And then you have the mayor's ordinance where she's going at it without any of the support of those groups, of the people. Um, and, I, and I've said this to the mayor, I don't believe a mayor should have make that call because the, the, the argument is about who makes the final call on police accountability. I think there is an inherent conflict of interest when you're depending on Chicago police to keep the city safe and then also are the person holding them accountable. So in order to separate that, I do think there needs to be a civilian component as uh, was mentioned when, these, when COPA, when the police board were all reconstituted, even the city recognized that and it's been a long time uh, for that to be established. So that is something that is truly one of the biggest fights I've ever been in my life. And I just wanted to make sure I communicated that to neighbors. Happy to talk about it. Happy to hear uh, what your opinions are. All right. Open government, our community zoning process. So this is a little bit of a briefer because you know every year we have different uh, proposals that come before the 40th Ward office. And we just want to make sure people understand the zoning process. So zoning requests are not created by the city. They're not created by the office. These are when private owners and developers want to change the zoning. They then reach out to the city to do so. Each board has its own process on how they do it. In some, there isn't a process. The alderman or the alder will just thumbs up, thumbs down and call the shots as Chicago history has shown. Um, the 40th Ward, we worked on making our process the most directly democratic process in the whole city. All ward residents are eligible to give feedback on zoning proposals. We put it on our 40th Ward website. We have a public meeting and a week long uh, feedback period, uh, regardless of the size of the development or proposal so that we can hear from you what you think, whether you support or oppose it. I then take all that information on a spreadsheet look at all of the feedback that we get, look at the total of, of support, the total of opposition, and then we typically end up with, you know, one of three options. Either the support is clear, the opposition is clear, or you end up with, you know, I don't know, I've got these concerns, and then we take those concerns, we go back to the developer and say, hey, if you're willing to address some of these, we can then revisit this with the neighbors and see if this is something that can move forward um, just to kind of be fair to the process. So current requests and feedback forms for all the proposals are included in our ward newsletters and they're also available on 40thward.org forward slash zoning requests. All right. So as of 2021, we have six proposals uh, total that have come before our office, three that I ended up supporting, one that I opposed, and two that are still going through the process. All right, next we've got the people's budget. And whenever I see the people's budget, I have to give the mandatory and obligatory shout out to Jesse Peters, who really took this whole thing on 
from beginning to end and has helped develop and improve it year over year. And I, uh, I hope that the neighbors are as happy and as proud as I am at the results. So here is what you got. So the people's budget, which is our, our particip participatory budgeting process, is where out of the 1.3 million, which is before now it's 1.5 million, uh, that are appropriated every year for each ward for infrastructure, uh, we take 1 million of those funds and put that out democratically. So we uh, put together committees of neighbors, together they form a ballot, we have neighbors across the ward, anyone can submit ideas to gather some support for those ideas, those get put on a ballot, and then the neighbors of the 40th ward get to vote on what they do with a million bucks. Kind of like a game show, except, you know, the prize is a little bit different. So, uh, Currently, you know, just to kind of some background, the menu money is funded through a $65 million bond to the city. So the only things that can be part of the menu process are permanent city public, uh, you know, programming, and, uh, cannot be used for programming, but permanent structures, permanent repair, uh, and it must be on city and public property. The 2021 budget includes improvements to the menu program. So it goes from 1.3 million, now to 1.5 million. Uh, you also get two green alleys per year that are part of the budget process and two blocks of piggyback street lighting per year. So compared to what we had before, where we didn't really have that option and had to figure out how to allocate funds, now we have those uh, that are included as part of the menu process, which in effect allows the 1.5 that are appropriated to go even further. All right, so we'll show you what 2020 looked like. So. I'm gonna thank Jesse for this as well, because Jesse runs point with the menu. Thanks to Jesse's efforts and making sure we were saving money every chance we could get, we saved $150,000 worth of your taxpayer dollars by making sure that the projects that we were working on were in areas where the city was already doing the work. So rather than paying extra for the city to open up a street, hey, the street's already getting open, let's see if we can do something there uh, and be more thoughtful with those dollars and have more strategy in place. Uh, we also, as you can see, and I won't go through each one, uh, cupboards, trees, bump outs, water fountains, cameras uh, for the area, as well as your infrastructure street work uh, and sidewalks as well. Uh, and as we move forward, we're going to keep continuing the process based on the feedback we heard from neighbors. So we'll have uh, processes where neighbors can submit pictures of those requests so we can then compare and see who really has damage uh, and needs to be the first uh, or prioritized uh, as far as support and improvements. All right, uh, 2021, we will be starting the process again, um, but some of the things that are happening now, um, that actually some of them were secured in the 2020, the last budget, but then we moving forward, are, are art at Bud Longwoods Library. So we're looking at the outside wall to kind of cover some of that. A dog park or dog friendly area at Winnemac Park, there's $100,000 appropriated towards that. Uh, street sidewalks and alleys were 850,000 tree planting about 50,000 and two blocks of residential lighting, 91,000. So those are all moving forward. Thanks to the democratic process and the votes of 40th Ward neighbors. All right, community engagement. And this picture is just awesome. These pictures are from last week when we had our uh, vaccination event. So we'll get into that. But I just really like looking at the amount of folks we were able to help because folks needed it. So uh, Neighbor Network Volunteer 2021 highlights. Uh, wanna highlight the Shovel Squad, as you can see our two animated volunteers on the picture. Uh, we end the season with over 70 houses uh, in the 40th Ward where we, I almost on a daily basis, were shoveling whenever the snow was over two inches. Uh, so I was going out there, getting my workout on. We had a, a number of volunteers that all helped um, and really take care of some seniors and disabled folks who needed it. So uh, we were able to get, to get out there in emergency situations to clear out so folks could make their health appointments. We were able to make sure people weren't getting ticketed if they weren't able to clean their own sidewalks. So we went out there. Um, we also put together, uh, you know, through, through my um, political side, some fundraising. And with neighbors, we're able to raise $4,000 specifically for snow support efforts. So thanks to 40th Ward neighbors, we got 50 shovels, we're gonna have, I think, 100 vests for our volunteers to wear out there. 
a lot more salt bags and we'll make sure it's pet friendly and uh, all the other things. And then we also were able to secure a snow blower. So in situations where we get something that was as bad as we saw this past year, we're able to address it more quickly and really cover more area. So also our neighbor network uh, has the, our call crew. So every Sunday from 12 to two, we've got neighbors that jump on a Zoom call and call neighbors in the 40th. We've done it since COVID started, um, we moved to more senior wellness checks. But as we were finding out about the United Center opening up, we're also calling neighbors to get them registered for their appointments. So we had over 1600 calls total. Wanted to definitely thank the volunteer efforts of the call crew for that work. And our COVID defense efforts. So uh, once we saw vaccination was moving, uh, we were scrambling as best as we could to get something set up. That led to helping launch the Western and Devon vaccination site in partnership with Prism Health Lab. That's at 6301 uh, Northwestern. Um, and then we tried to reach out to the city. Um, so the 39th, 40th, 48th, 47th, 49th and 50th wards had all met uh, to really try to get a plan from Chicago Department of Public Health uh, as to what they were going to do for the north side or northeast side of town, recognizing that South and West did need uh, Protect Plus and did need to have a focus on equity, but recognizing also that our neighbors here who are uh, have some of marginalized populations, we also needed a plan. And you know, when we didn't get a response from CEPH about when we could have a meeting to talk about this stuff, they were directing us to a hearing. Um, our office, and with the help of uh, the second ward, office, we're able to figure out a partnership with Jewel Osco, uh, where we were able to get a supply of uh, 1,560 vaccine doses. Uh, we then reached out to Park District and scrambled as fast as we could to secure an area and got the River Park Fieldhouse, then worked together with Swedish Hospital as they let us use some of the parking space and a lot of their resources to put together our vaccination event in the 40th Ward. Uh, we reached out to uh, some people to help sponsor because we want to make sure we feed the folks that were helping us out. So PepsiCo was able to provide snacks and beverages for our volunteers and staff. Mr. Kebab, a 40th Ward business, provided lunch. Uh, we were able to kind of get some funds together to do that. Um, so really, this was a total community effort. We had 80 volunteers across two shifts. We started at 6 a.m., ended around 6 p.m. Uh, it was a full day. And it was really amazing. I mean, I, you know, you put together something like this and you expect every curveball under the sun, you anticipate things going wrong, but it was really smooth. Um, there was a really good energy. A lot of our 40s were neighbors just brought their best and we kept hearing it from neighbor after neighbor who was in line to get vaccinated, that they really appreciated the process. They were not waiting long. Uh, also wanna shout out the Jewel staff. The Jewel Osco staff were doing 60 doses every 15 minutes and we're operating like a machine. So we were able to get those uh, 1,500 plus uh, doses out there. Uh, the second event will be on April 15th. So we'll be reaching out for more volunteers at that time as well uh, to make sure we can complete the dose. Uh, Same place, uh, make sure that if you got your first shot that you bring your CDC card or, or that has a time on it, but also bring your informed consent uh, form with you. Uh, and then when we wrapped up the event, as we were cleaning up boxes and everything else, uh, we got word from Swedish Hospital that the 500 people who were on the wait list, they would take those folks and then uh, call them and schedule appointments to get their shots with Swedish. So it really couldn't have gone better uh, than it did. And we even have more partnership and more opportunities to help our neighbors get vaccinated. So now that we know we, uh, how to run the operation, we're just trying to get more supply. And as we get more, we'll be doing more events, but we also know that 1C is opened up. And so the dynamics are changing and there are more places for people to get vaccinated. Having said that, we will continue to work to find other ways to take care of our neighbors. Uh, also wanted to shout out our field team and special events team, which are volunteers who help for so many different things. Uh, but we just had our Shred-a-thon event this past Saturday, also smooth sailing, also didn't have a, a a ton of neighbors coming at the same time, disorganized. We had a nice line. We're able to get people to, to dump all the stuff they wanted to get shredded. 
um, and at the end still had room for other folks. So it worked out really well. Um, if we do need to do a subsequent event, there is a uh, cost associated with that, but we'll be reaching out to neighbors should there be that demand for it. All right, that is all I've got. Uh, up until we do the quick shout outs and tell you where to go next after, but now we are opened up for questions. So Jesse, if you would be so kind as to go into either the pre uh, sent questions or the chat, we will do our best. I gotcha. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with the pre-submitted questions. Um, <clears throat> Kane, um, this one came from Diane. Um, they're asking how can we address the plastic and glass, aluminum and coffee cups that are just kind of thrown, thrown away around the city, um, right, like uh, many of the cans and bottles are alcoholic and then they're just thrown out of cars. Um, would you consider an ordinance that requires a deposit on each item sold? So I'd have to do get more research on requiring a deposit on each item sold because I think that has ramifications for the business as well as for like neighbors. But um, I do think this is a about awareness and potentially enforcement. So some of it uh, and, and thing as we're going into April with Earth Day and like really a focus on, on Earth in general, we're trying to find ways to partner with 40th Ward businesses um, like uh, Eco and Flamingo. Uh, that are no waste businesses to try to get that message across because a lot of it is changing the behavior and if people do what's most convenient just throw stuff around it causes a problem it also is identifying where else in the ward we could have more um you know uh containers for recycling so people can can put them where they need to go um but it is something that's been challenging what we want to make sure is that we get as much information as possible but that we are doing our best to make sure neighbors are aware of not only don't throw your stuff, but also at home, make sure you're separating your recyclables. Make sure that if they are recyclable, you're cleaning them. It is a culture change that requires all of us. Wonderful. Um, Kay and Bob, um, so they really liked the email that was sent out last week, kind of summarizing the way that the city council meeting went, specifically kind of the explanation around the council rules. Mm -hmm. They're asking, um, since it appears right to be this tool for obstruction, much like the Senate filibuster, are there any initiatives to change how it's used? So there have been conversations about what changes could be made. Now, I think what's challenging is you need 26 city council members to vote in support of something in order to get it moving. Um, so this is something that what we're thinking is we have to continue to put focus on and raise that pressure so they hear from the public um, because that is what people do in city council. If they don't like your ordinance, they dump it in the rules and there it languishes. Um, but, you know, something that could be done is potentially making it more of a process to submit something into rules. Maybe instead of just shouting out another committee, you actually have to put paperwork together 48 hours in advance or provide paperwork after and getting people to sign off on that change. Um, if you make it as easy as just shouting out a word in a city council meeting, you're gonna see things get dumped in a rule. So it is about changing that process. Thank you. Um, and shout out to Jeffrey for the lesson as well. Oh, uh, yes, and shout out to Jeffrey, not only for that lesson, but also every week, if you all are seeing now, we're providing, or every city council meeting, we're providing legislative updates. So we're not just talking about constituent services, we also want people to learn how the city council works. So really glad to have heard uh, that neighbors like it and we'll continue to do it. Um, this next question um, is really focused around the Bowmanville area. Okay. Um, so uh, is it possible to have the Streets and Sands crew clean up the field where all the snow was dumped around the 5300 block of Bowmanville? The snow's melted, but it contained a lot of trash and now it's all over the lot. Um, so what can what can be done to have the trash collected and the ground reseeded? There's a few people that ask that question. Yeah, and let me provide some background. So typically that would not have been a problem when we had the forestry, Bureau of Forestry staging site in that area. Um, when that was removed, 
and now it's private land, we no longer had that space to dump it, which the city would uh, have done in private land that it may have had. Um, that got dumped there because, as you all remember, it was going really quickly and people were finding places to, to, to actually put all this stuff. Now, I reached out to Bill uh, Hoenado, who is our ward superintendent, uh, to find out what could be done. So part of it was waiting for all the snow to melt and then having a team come out and spread some of the dirt out so it wasn't a huge mound, cleaning out some of what's already there. And then looking to see where else we could identify space pace where else we could identify places to take it so right now we reached out um, Ellen from our team had reached out to streets and sanitation to figure out where else that could actually be taken and that has yet to be identified so when we get that from the city we'll then look to see how much we can potentially move from one place to the other and what could actually be spread and like taken care of on the actual site Thank you for that. Yep. Um, next, um, I'm going to take the answer just because I don't know if you know the development property, but um, the next one is there's a neighbor that's asking about the planned rezoning um, in the neighborhood near Washtenaw and Farragut. Um, and we for that project, we returned it to the developer for adjustments and to ask for studies on traffic and parking impacts. Um, and we're still waiting for that that to be resubmitted um, and to go back, kind of go back through and evaluate it. So there's not a decision for a uh, the Washtenaw Farragut one. Like, a, like I mentioned earlier, right? You get your three options. Your Support, oppose, and this seems to be the third, where we take that feedback, go back to the developer, and then come back to the neighbors. And real quick, just to add to that one as well, that that's one that is one for an affordable housing development that was proposed. It is also dependent on some state tax credits that we don't have direct control over and that are a competitive application process. I know that they, they are hoping to get those, but don't know if they will or not. So whether they're able to resubmit and move forward with that depends on uh, some factors at the state level as well. So. I kept thinking Foster, now that you said it, I get it. Very yeah, it's the same block. It, it's Washtenaw, uh, you know, running down to Foster Avenue. So. Okay. Thank you for that, Jeffrey. Um, next question is, um, Anne is asking if, um they've heard about an upkick in random crime and they're curious if it's true just feels like there are more strange things going on right now yeah um there there has been an uptick citywide as far as criminal activity um uh, some of it i it, it when you look at where some of the cause of crime happens in the first place right it's because there's there's this economic inequality that's going on and we we're talking about a city where parts of town haven't been invested for generations, right? And when people don't have options, they kind of do desperation, do things they, they're trying to survive. That was bad enough before COVID. Once COVID uh, hit all of us, it then exacerbated that issue. So you did see an increase of activity across the city. Now I've been in communication with the commanders at the 17th, 19th, 20th and 24th district since taking office, um, try to really get a track on, on the trend. And just for background, um, prior to being in office, I was also a civilian facilitator for CAPS uh, for some time. So I've got an understanding of like what the trends are, what the reporting is. So there has been increase, there has been activity. Um, as far as what can be done, um, you know, there had been increased uh, efforts as far as patrolling, but what's really gotten some of the work done is there are two different things. Uh, CPD, uh, their investigatory arm has actually done a really good job of tying incidents together to a larger stream. So, uh, you know, I remember, I think a couple of weeks ago, two individuals were arrested uh, in association with some activity that has occurred here. They were arrested out in the suburbs, but they were able to get tied in through the investigation. Uh, the other thing that has been really helpful in the 40th Ward is our partnership with street organizations. So here in the 40th Ward, there's a group called Communities Partnering for Peace that are based out of the ward. Um, and what they are, uh, what they are and what they do is there are former gang members who reach out to active uh, gang members to resolve conflict, to try to get them out of being active members and to find solutions uh, that are proactive. 
And so, uh, for example, on Foster and Damon, we were having an uptick of a lot of graffiti that was going on due to a uh, really was going to become a gang war between South Side and North Side Latin Kings. And it was this group, Communities Partner, Partnering for Peace, that interjected themselves in order to stop any conflict that was going on and actually mitigated damage. So I think when we're coupling all these different public safety components together and really identifying ways that we can solve these issues, we get a lot done. So yes, there has been an increase, but there are also things that are being done. And you know, if folks wanna learn more, I'd recommend going to CAPTA meetings and checking out some of that. And just for, for background, our office, when we get incidents that are that merit it, meaning they're violent uh, incidents or something more you know serious, we then send the word out the newsletter to let neighbors know. Thank you for that. Uh, just doing a time check. That might be all of the questions that we have uh, time for today. You do, are you doing a time check with me? No, I'm telling you that that's all the questions that we have time for. Sorry. Yeah, okay. I was, like, I was like, you know me, I'll sit here and answer some more, but that's just because I'm nuts like that. All right. So uh, those folks that submitted questions, uh, we will have them as usual. We'll get them from the chat. We'll put them on a share drive. We'll answer those questions and get back to the neighbors to make sure that you get those questions answered. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that we had you informed of everything going on in the 40th, but we do want to make sure we're answering the questions. So before I go, here's my quick shout out for next week, Monday, 6 p.m. to 7. We will be introducing Communities Partnering for Peace and other street outreach organizations to the 40th Ward neighbors. They're our neighbors. They've helped us out here. I want to make sure that when we're talking about public safety, that people actually get to wrap their heads around what some of these alternative public safety solutions are. So we are partnering with One North Side, Communities Partnering for Peace, and Metropolitan Family Services to provide a town hall and introduce you to those groups. So we will get that word out via all our regular platforms, but I wanted to flag that for you. So next Monday, same bat time, similar bat channel, we'll be here. Uh, and then if you all need to reach out to our office, website is 40thward.org. The office number is 773-654-1867. Shout out to our virtual front desk volunteers for helping out when folks do call, as well as our solution team volunteers for solving a lot of those problems. Uh, we've got our Facebook, our Instagram, and our Twitter. We're not on TikTok yet. I don't think we will, but you never know. But these are the ways to contact us. Thank you all so much for making the time. We also have recorded this. So we'll be able to share this with neighbors across different platforms. And tonight, I will be debuting our Lincoln Avenue North video, showing you some more of what we want to get done there now that we've announced the $15 million TIF uh, development that will be happening. So you all have a great night. Stay safe. Get vaccinated if you can. And look forward to seeing you all. Take care.